Do you know anyone with a, an old Gary Owen jersey? And we're doing this, the sporting life. Yeah. And he's a rugby player in it, so. I know, Eddie Machen. Frank. Frank Machen. Frank Machen. That's right, Frank, yeah. And, uh, he's a brilliant fella. Oh, stuff. I saw that in the 60s. Magic. He got, his no, he got his nose broken. Yeah. For the, yeah, and <laughs> yeah. we have to put it in oh, place. And, the, and, the, and, the, the, and, his, and his teeth, yeah. <laughs> that's what made it. That's what started him, actually. I think that's the main. That, one. Yeah, yeah, I kicked off the... He got nominated. He, got, he won a can award for that. He did. Yeah. And nominated for Oscar. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, that's... Thank you, Eddie, and to everybody else who left comments on our recorded comment line. The number there, by the way, is 400, that's 400-961, and it is open 24 hours a day. And the question of the lying-in hospital and how it is spelt was solved. Uh, that riddle within uh, those comments, and thank you for that, because we got uh, a call about that earlier in the week on the show. Now, we will be talking in a few minutes' time about Richard Harris, and I can promise you it's going to have a twist that I certainly <laughs> did not expect. Uh, Richard Harris uh, passed away 10 years ago this very day, and it was just looking at that supplement about the University of Limerick in the Limerick Leader a couple of weeks ago, and a very prominent front page photo of a young and dashing Richard Harris making a speech uh, on the streets of Limerick um, seeking a university status uh, for uh, this fine city that reminds you how much charisma and style the man had. It actually comes through the years in that albeit black and white photo, but a brilliant one. Uh, so we want to hear uh, your memories of Richard Harris. Did you come across him? If you didn't, did you enjoy him uh, in films? Uh, have you heard stories uh, about him? Uh, we'd like to hear all of those. 53095 for 20 cent. That is our text line. And of course, you can call us directly on 461995. 461995 is the number. And we have a call of the week prize with thanks to Heavenly Feet Shoes, guaranteed to put a spring in your step, a weekend for two in the four-star Castle Court Hotel and Spa, Westport County Mayo, to include two nights B&B &B and an evening meal. Very nice caller of the week prize. Now, just a quick look at the newspaper. City edition of the Limerick Leader. Woman on trial for intimidating key witnesses. And you've been hearing about that on Live 95 FM News during the week. Taxi branding could lead to more vandalism, say Limerick taxi drivers. And city businessman Shane Gleeson of Spar and Catherine Street wants high noon extension to free parking scheme in the run up to Christmas. The Limerick Post city rental scam alert. A warning is being issued to people on the lookout for rented accommodation in Limerick City about a sophisticated scam in the business of private lettings. And the Limerick Olympics, this is the special. Uh, Olympics Ireland Games will be better than ever coming back to us in 2014 announced this week. Nationally the Irish Daily Mail Quinn to abolish 80 allowances in swinging cuts slash and burn for teachers pay deals and Melanie Vervoort buy my book and judge for yourself what I've said about Jerry Ryan. The Irish Daily Star here's one for you this is some headline GA players privates torn open in match Opponent denies assault over horror. We move swiftly on from that. The Irish Examiner, holidays in school year, harm pupils' education. And Enda, European of the Year in Germany as ratings fall at home. He's doing really well in the international media. There he was uh, on the front page of Time, and uh, now a European uh, association, a German one to be precise, of magazines, have said he's the European of the year. Oh yeah, they gave it to the Irish people as well for our enormous sacrifices. Kind of them. The uh, Mirror, Georgia sacked, big story. Beauty, this is Georgia Salpa, gets boot from model boss Andrea over canceled photo shoots. The Irish Times, Lenehan's letter on bailout acceptance is released and incredible bitterness displayed in Quinn case, says judge. Dissenting judgment notes injustices felt by each side. And finally, the Indo, house prices take biggest jump since 2007. Could we finally be at the bottom? And Gardaí probe rape claim against major celebrity. Woman alleges she gave birth to his baby 
detectives seeking DNA report on her child. She recently walked into a Garda station, but the incident is alleged to have happened in the 1970s. They obviously haven't named the major celebrity, but he is described as a prominent figure in the Irish entertainment world. Now, as I mentioned, we're talking this morning about Richard Harris. I want you to become protector of Rome after I die. <coughs> I will empower you to give power back to the people of Rome. And the corruption. Do you accept this great honor that I have offered? With all my heart, no. Maximum. That is why you must be you. Richard Harris in Gladiator. Now, a celebration of his life takes place tonight in the loft in Limerick City on the 10th anniversary of his passing as part of the Limerick Unfringed Festival. Joining me now is director of the show, Mark O'Connor, and Live 95 FM's Lendeline, who knew the great man. You're both very welcome. Good morning to you. Um, Mark, you actually mentioned to me off the air that Len is an appropriate person to have here this morning. Indeed, I'm I'm quite honoured to be in in the room with your good self, Joe, and I'm, and but Lendon uh Richard Harris biographies that I've read, um, me, uh, mention you quite a bit in there. So, um, but that's not the only reason. Obviously, you're you're the man. Uh, my brother tunes into you every time over in New York when when the when the rugby matches are on and everything. So, big deal indeed. What inspired you to do this show at the Loft? Um, well. Strictly speaking, Liam O'Brien had the idea initially. Uh, Liam's a very well-known actor in Limerick, and he got on to me and said, Mark, it's t Richard's 10-year anniversary, we should do a show. And I was, absolutely. And then, uh, happily, um, R Liam got uh, taken on to do uh, Shakespeare work for the next year. He's touring with a company in England for the next year, so he had to pull out. Um, so I've kind of led, led the charge since. And uh, we've got a great, a great show ready to go tonight. Um, we have uh, about ten uh, actors locally putting on um, three of Richard's most famous pieces: um, "The Sporting Life," "The Field," and "Gladiator." We're doing readings for, of excerpts of these. Tonight. Now, the thing about Richard Harris, Len, is that, and maybe this is even more the case since his passing, it is as much about the myth as the man. Yeah, he started being canonised in some places, and, and that was far from Dicky because he was a very flamboyant character, Joe. Um, he was as large as life, you know, a, a great actor, brilliant actor, but he had a great love for rugby, and that's where I came across him first when I was playing with London Irish. He used to come down uh, to London Irish to watch some of the matches. His brother Dermot, uh, who became his manager, his younger brother Dermot, uh, I'd be we'd be talking out in the, in the dressing room and next thing Dermot's head would come round the door he said we're here no I said oh my god my, we're here meant that Dicky was there with his entourage and there was usually a party you know and um, he just to put a few bob behind the bar what glamour he must have brought though to the sideline oh yeah oh, it was yeah and he, he was you know he loved he loved shouting and roaring and I remember I remember on one occasion I was injured actually we were playing London Welsh London Welsh at that time fabulous side they had eight lines on that team and it was at old deer park at their ground and we were walking across the pitch and, uh, and he came up by me and the first thing he says to me how's your father now my dad uh, kevin denine was found a member one of the founder members of the college players and that was where dicky actually cut his teeth in acting and in fact just a little story about that dicky was dyslexic the dyslexics and, uh, and people didn't know that but he was reading a part, mm -hmm. and uh, and he he stumbled over the over the lines, and uh, Dad just uh, very intolerant. My father, my late <laughs> father, he said, "Would you take someone else take that?" You know, so so that was Dickie's first experience with the college players. But then, of course, he went on twenty three years of age. I think he left. Yeah, he left Limerick. This sporting life was what shot him to worldwide fame, Mark. Tell me about that movie because a lot of people don't know about it of the current generation. Yeah, um, it's it's a, it's a tough one to come across. It's um, I, I I had to order in a copy, especially or whatever. But um, yeah, it's about a, a character called Frank Machen uh, playing for a Wakefield uh, City Rugby League team, and he's uh, living with uh, a widow, 
and they kind of hook up, but um, she's not moving on at all. She's cleaning her, her dead husband's boots in the fireplace in the hearth, and uh, Frank Machen sees this, and he tries to provide for her in every way, and um, it's a quite a tragic story. You know, it, 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 uh, they get close, um, sort of, but it, it, just, it just sort of goes downhill. He keeps pushing her and pushing her, and she's just not ready to, to accept it, that person into his life. Rugby life. league was then a professional sport, unlike uh, rugby union, and a lot of sports movies have attempted to um, articulate the emptiness of a, a professional sportsman's life from time to time. That movie with Harris did it. Yeah, it's such a harsh, cold, and he's like digging the mines during the day, and then he finally gets signed on. But uh, to Dickie's credit, I mean, it was, he he could bring it physically, like you know, and he had to earn the trust of the cast, who were real rugby players, and uh, he spent time up there. And his rugby, his rugby earlier rugby days stood to him. Um, there goes a story that uh, he was practicing kicking goals for a long time before he ever met the team. And he would, and he had to like earn his stripes with them on the on the spot, so it all came down to like one kick. Okay, guys, if you don't believe me, watch me do this, you know. And he said a little prayer and then took a kick and it went over. So like, all right, mate, you're all right, you know. <laughs> yeah, so. and it was rugby league, but it must have meant so much to him coming from a city like Limerick to star and be so successful in that movie. Oh, uh, Joe, I saw the movie in the '60s, and it, it was black and white, and it was a tremendous. Rachel was it? Rachel Roberts. Rachel Roberts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rachel Roberts played absolutely, Lindsay and she was she was brilliant. But he played number eight in that team, and he got his nose broken, and his teeth, all his front teeth knocked out in that in one particular sequence. But he must have loved, you know, playing playing the part because he he was. I mean, he he was a good rugby player himself in his younger days. He he was at the Crescent. He was what he was ten years ahead of me in the Crescent. So I didn't remember him in the Crescent. But he played in a famous team, nineteen forty nine team, which won the Munster Senior Schools Cup. Gordon Wood. Keith Woods' father, Gordon was on that team. Gordon went down, of course, to be a line. And after that, then he played with Gary Owen. Old Crescent didn't have a senior team then. 1951, he won a, a Munster Cup medal with Gary Owen. Subsequently, he he became a life member of Young Monster for some reason or other. Now tell me, is this story true that at certain points in his lifetime when he used to come back to the occasional Young Monster game and he'd turn up at Tom Clifford Park, the whole crowd would turn around and say, oh, go away, every time you come, Dickie, we lose. <laughs> true story, Joe, because that, that is in fact what happened. You know, he'd, he'd put a few bob behind the bar, he'd go down to Charlie St. George's, but he was known as a Jonah because even, even Mick Galway, when in the year 2000, when Munster got to our first final, as you know, Joe against Northampton Saints, Dickie turned up with Peter O'Toole. They went into the dressing room after the match and Galway said, he looked at him, oh, geez, I might have known him. Well, no one, he says, you're a Jonah, he says, a Jonah, you know. But he loved his rugby so much. that, In fact, he got a Munster Schools uh, uh, jersey and he had that jersey. Now, he said it was the original jersey. Uh, for that particular match and there is a little ch clip on YouTube where he takes off his own jersey and shows put the monster jersey and he said look there's the mud he was showing out too the, the mud and the jersey yeah, yeah, yeah. so Richard Harris famous monster supporter Peter O'Toole famous monster supporter and since Sunday David Rudisha the Olympic gold medalist is a famous monster supporter on the pitch we want to take a break after that uh, for younger listeners uh, you might remember Richard Harris in something more modern. Excellent, very cool. good. Cool. Really as, as Dumbledore. Dumbledore, yeah. Nice one. Um, I, I must. Uh, what's a Jonah exactly? A Jonah is is a Jonah. Remember Jonah and the whale? Yeah. Uh, he was. He was. Uh, he put a dampener and everything. Do you know, he would. He would. He, he was gu you were guaranteed to lose, basically. Lose. If you okay. Turn up. okay. Yeah. All right. So I suppose that's a true story, and I tell you, in unparliamentary language as well, the oh, yeah. Munster fans like they oh, wouldn't exactly be, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be sort of <laughs> Sir Dicky. Would you mind leaving? Yeah, 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 yeah. The Bollix is here, <laughs> and he used to love it, of course, the fecker. He loved it. He got a thing you see about Gary Owen, and, and uh, they were snobbish in that. And yeah. he wanted the real grassroots. That's yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. That was that's why thing, he turned. Yeah. To yeah, that was his thing. That was his thing. Yeah. Yeah. Of your time, Joe, we have a few stories about it. Absolutely. Yeah. 
There's a letter from him up in the Charlie Hello? St. George framed, you know. Yeah, this is going well, uh, so we're going to... Yeah, yeah, it's very on the, interesting. On the, on, the, on the set of some of, the, <coughs> some of his films. Yeah. Uh, just giving out about the selection of Limerick players. Yeah. That, you well, know, he was, and, oh, he had, he had a, deep, a deep love for... for, for uh, if wherever he was in the world. Mm. Vincent Finucane used to send him tapes, Joe. You know that? Send him videos of matches, Limerick matches. Oh, yeah. And sent him to Limerick leader as well. Wherever he would be in the Bahamas or wherever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a deep love for Limerick. Oh no, I did absolutely. Yeah. Visiting Cork, the four-star Silver Springs Morn Hotel is the perfect choice with rooms from just sixty-nine euro. Call Joe, if we've time, like the, I might just give a name shout out to each of the cast. Absolutely, um, yeah, we'll do that. No problem. Yeah. In business, it pays to have a good plan. Okay, today I'm going to reduce my total telecoms costs by at least fifteen percent by making one simple call, and that's exactly that's, um, our aircon business. That video you were talking about the. Uh, Oh yeah, that one, yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah, himself and OT. They look at the jersey. Joe, 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 there's the jersey now. Look, and the and the modern it looks. He was playing with the show, man, like you know. I got one cap. Monster look. One cap. And then Macho too now. This is before the match first. Oh, I think he. Are you tackling me? You tackle well. We use you. We bring you on the last five minutes. If forty fails. And then you can be on the Messers. Uh, Limerick, we've made it big just for you. Limerick today, a Limerick today. The guide to fashion and beauty inside today's Irish Daily Mail. A different view every day. Are the rumors true? Help us. I'm afraid so, Professor. The good and the Who did he play in this? Dumbledore, Albus Dumbledore. Do you think it wise to trust Hagrid with something as important as would this? Would have made him a multi-millionaire again. Mm. I would yeah. trust Hagrid with my life. Um, Richard Harris there playing Dumbledore in Harry Potter and it just gives you an idea of the scope and scale of his career. Uh, you tell a great story, Len, about um, a very famous woman making sandwiches for you. Wasn't that all connected to some degree to London Irish and Harris and Burton and... Yeah. That's that. That was uh, Richard Harris, our uh, Richard Burton's wife, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah. London Welshman, really. Yeah, uh, uh, Richard Burton played for the London Welsh second team, the Droads, but uh, they had to. His his director was was in, uh, informed him that uh, he wasn't going to play anymore. He got his nose broken, funnily enough, in one particular match, and he said, "And your man says that's that." He says the insurance won't cover you anymore, Richard. But uh, he he was a great he was a great pal of of uh, Dickie Harris's, of course, and they used to go to some matches together. And uh, that one in in uh, Old Deer Park against London Welsh, couldn't believe it when we came in off the pitch afterwards, uh, making sandwiches for the team. As, uh, you know, the food was very sparse in those days. Was one Elizabeth Taylor in the ladies' committee? I couldn't believe it. You know, when you think back on it, you know, it's like yeah. a dream. You know, <laughs> uh, what a time that was in London. Of course, the so. swinging sixties, as they say. Uh, Mark, um, he, of course, he was not only an accomplished act, accomplished actor, but he did receive an Academy Award nomination, and he won Best Actor at the Cannes Film Festival, isn't that right? Correct. Uh, that was the sporting life that really launched everything, and uh, he got nominated again for an Oscar in uh, for the, his performance in The Field, which kind of was started part two of Dickie's career. I think there was a bit of quiet time there in the 80s, where, as he admits himself, he made a, a few howlers. You know, but uh, he, he went from strength to strength after the field, um, appearing in Unforgiven, uh, the Clint Eastwood film, and of course Gladiator, um, and uh, finishing, I think his last performance then was uh, in the Harry Potter films, who at the insistence of his granddaughter, I believe, he, he was told, you better go 
better go do that. A texter is saying, uh, Derek in Limerick, uh, Morning Joe, Richard Harris was a legend. I met him in Shannon when he was in Limerick to film 60 Minutes, the famous US program. I got a photo with him uh, in 2009. Uh, I was uh, acting with Harris, pal, Peter O'Toole in the Tudors, so I got to meet two legends and that comes in from uh, Derek Ward and thank you very much Derek for reminding us of that. We're going to have a very special moment now since you mentioned the Bull McCabe, uh, one of Richard Harris' iconic roles. Uh, Mark, you are about to act and it is a privilege for you with yeah. Mr. Len Deneen. My One of the, the uh, greatest line bashing moments of my career so far I think, yes. So Len, are you ready? This is a scene. Awesome. Yeah, from this is uh, the, one of the most famous <coughs> scenes from the, the field is um, when uh, Harris has just seen a no trespassing order go up on his own field or what he perceives to be his field. And you are playing the bull? On the bull. And, and uh, Len is playing the priest. The priest. We storm into the priest's house. So off you go there. Uh, what's your first line there again? Uh, uh, there's a bit of, co of conflict going on here now. Yeah, okay, here we go. Why are you interfering, Father? This is none of the church's business. It's the widow's field. She has the right to sell it. No. It's my field. It's my child. I nursed it. I, I nourished it. I saw to its every want. I dug the rocks out of it with my bare hands and I made a living thing out of it. My only wealth is that green grass, that lovely green grass, and you want to take it away from me and in the sight of God I can't let you do that. Can't you find another field? Another field? Another field? Jesus, you're as far in here as that yank. Another field. Are you blind? Those hands. Do you see those hands? Those rocks. It was a dead thing. Don't you understand? This is the widow's field. That's the law. The common law. Well, there's another law. Stronger than the common law. What's that? The law of the land. When I was a boy, younger than Tyg there, my brothers and sisters, they had to leave the land because I couldn't support them. Now, we wasn't rich enough to be priests or doctors. So it was the emigrant ship for all of them. But I was the eldest, the heir. I was the only one left at home. Labour was scarce, so my father and I, we had our breakfast, dinner and tea working in that field without a break in our work. And the mother used to bring us up the meals. And one day, one day my father sensed a, a drop of rain in the air. The mother helped us bring up the hay before it was too late. She was working in one corner of the field and I was working in the other. About the third day, I saw her fall back, keel over, so to speak. I called my father. I ran to her. My father knelt beside her. He, he knew she was... He knew she was dying. He said an act of contrition into her ear, and he asked God to forgive her sins. And he looked at me, and he said, Fetch a priest. Fetch a priest. And I said, Let's... Let's bring in the hair first. Let's bring the hay in first. <coughs> My father looked at me with tears of pride in his eyes. He knew I'd take care of the land. And if you think I'm going to face my mother in heaven or in hell without that field, you've got something else coming. No collar, uniform or weapon will protect the man that stands in my way. Superb. Richard Harris would be proud, Mark, of you and of Len. Um, and, of course, John Kenny has played that uh, superbly recently, too, that character, the bull. And I think many, many people remember uh, the bull and, and Richard Harris in later life for it. But he also featured, uh, of course, famously, in Camelot. Superb. Superb. Good stuff. Would I make a good priest, Joe? Would make a good priest. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Steph. Camelot is excellent enough. Father Lendonine. <laughs> Let's get a ring to it. <laughs> the late, great Richard Harris in Camelot. The Harris family uh, in Limerick, Glen. Tell me a little about them. Well, they had a flour mill there, Joe, just up the road here in, in Henry Street, and uh, they were a very wealthy family, uh, And but unfortunately uh, things went a bit downhill uh, with, with the mill. But uh, the, all the lads, there was, I think it was five lads, there was, uh, Ivan was the eldest, Jimmy, and then you had uh, 
Dickey and um, you had uh, Dermot. Dermot was younger than Dickey, he became his manager. And then you had young Billy. And the only, the only uh, brother that's living is Noel, who was a very good looking chap, who, was, uh, who played lead roles in the Sicilian Musical Society. They had a daughter, I think there was two girls there, Amy Harris, who married uh, Jackie Donnelly, who was manager of the Barclay Court. And in fact, Dickey would stay in the Barclay Court uh, quite a number of times, you know. He got a love for hotels there, I suppose, Joe, because as you know, in his latter years, he, he stayed in the Savoy Hotel. He lived in the Savoy Hotel in the Penthouse Suite, and there's a famous story, of course, uh, when he, would, when he got, took ill in the Savoy Hotel, and he was being actually taken away in a stretcher. And uh, he was going through the foyer. You can imagine the the, the, the interest and the fear. The, every everyone looking, Richard Harris on the stretcher, you know. And as he was going out on the stretcher, typical Dicky, he sat up on the stretcher. He said, "It's the food, the food." <laughs> <laughs> they loved him for that in the Savoy. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mark, I suppose the only problem you had in relation to tonight was trying to decide what to leave out and what to put in because uh, such a, a breath uh, to his career. Absolutely. Um, I mean, where do you start? Where do you finish? Um, well, I, the way I'm looking at it is, I mean, I never met the guy, right? But I could be maybe an example of how the power of his legacy, because uh, the, the acting performances stand up for themselves. But if you dig a little deeper and, and research it on YouTube and just see the interviews he does with Charlie Rose and uh, Johnny Carson and Conan O'Brien and even on The Late Late Show, um, he really knew his craft, and but not only as an actor, he was a poet and a, and a musician as well. MacArthur Park uh, is like the paranoid android, Bohemian Rhapsody of its time. It was a seven-minuter uh, where the DJ could stick it on and go out for a, a slash and come back. And um, But uh, just the timelessness of that recording for me, I'm a musician more so than an actor, and um, it's Jimmy Webb, it knocked the Beatles off the top spot, it's... an beautifully crafted, uh, composed piece of music and recorded and it's got that swing in 60s bit in the middle and it's got Dickie's voice on the top of it all with a limerick accent singing never uh, have that recipe again you know it's just I never get tired of listening to it or performing it. Who else do you want to mention in connection with tonight at the loft? Indeed um, so joining me, joining me tonight um, uh, along with, we're going to have a good few YouTube bits up on the wall as well, showing, for instance, that uh, the great clip with uh, Peter O'Toole and Richard Harris at one of the, the Munster Rugby finals in, in Twic Twickenham. But we'll have some fun with that. But um, in terms of putting on the readings of the films, um, Joanne Ryan is uh, going to play the part of Margaret Hammond, and I'll be doing Frank Machen. Um, we have Tom Muldowney of the Limerick Writers' Centre. He's going to be reading some of the poems. Um, we have a, a man called Fergus, Fergus Costello, a very uh, great performer, very funny guy. Uh, he's doing a, a, an original piece called A Man Called Horse. Um, and then doing the field, uh, we'll have Noel Egan uh, taking your role there, Len. He's doing the part of the priest. We have uh, Jared Naden doing the yank and the very talented, they're all very talented, but Connor J. Ryan, uh, you may know him from singing uh, uh, the Voice of Ireland and everything. Uh, Connor J. Ryan is going to be Tig, uh, and I'll be doing the bull, as you just heard. And then we have a, a very interesting performance from a local ballet group called jo Just Breathing. And uh, the girl's name there, her name is Jenny Brown. She's going to be doing an interpretive piece around the themes from uh, Gladiator, which will introduce the Gladiator piece. Which uh, And for Gladiator, we're, we have an all-star cast there. Mike Finn will be Marcus Aurelius. Pius McGrath is doing the role of Maximus. And Donald Ryan will be Commodus. Right, it so, sounds like a uh, tremendous evening. Uh, and uh, t this evening at the loft uh, from 10. From uh, 10, yeah. And uh, 10 euro. And I'll tell you, you couldn't spend your money any better. Listen, we could talk about Richard Harris for the rest of the day on this the 10th anniversary of his passing. Thank you very much, Mark. Great performance sounds. with Len and... Uh, I'm sure there will be a huge attendance tonight. And it's great that he is being marked in his home place on the 10th anniversary of his death. And then thank you very much for coming in and telling us great stories uh, about a man that uh, you knew well. Pleasure, Joy. But he should have been made uh, Limerick citizen. Uh, you know, a Freeman. Should, Freeman in the city. Sure, really should have. Because I'll tell you something. Uh, uh, Jimmy Wolf, we were talking about him there last year, in fact. And Jimmy was saying, no matter where you're going in the world, if you mention Richard Harris's name, every, they, everyone knows him. But he was so, I mean, he was so proud of his native city. 
and Vincent Fanukin used to send him out tapes of the matches and the Limerick leader as well. No matter where he was in the world, he always kept up to date what was happening in Limerick. It was a pity, but it's gone now. Thank you, gentlemen. And we go into the break with, uh, as Mark mentioned, just a clip, because we're not playing all seven minutes of it this morning, <laughs> of MacArthur Park. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> you're dead right about that. That's the one you go for a pee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was really yeah. brilliant. Mark, well done. Good you stuff. were brilliantly Good prepared stuff. and it made Good great stuff. radio. And thank, thank you, Len, as always. Okay, that was great and I hope tonight goes well for you. Great stuff. Thanks. Thanks. Brilliant stuff. Makes good video as well. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, good wave there now, Joe. Nice one. <laughs> right, Joe. <laughs> 